Happy Saturday, everyone. Welcome to Keeneland at Home, presented by UK Healthcare. This is the way we enjoy the races. A special thanks to Steve Buttleman for kicking us off in style as per usual. I'm your host, Christina Blacker, and I'll ask you once more, use that hashtag, let your friends know that you are watching the show, that you are enjoying the fantastic world-class racing at Keeneland with hashtag Keeneland at Home. As per usual today, I have some great features for you. I have a really exciting jockey interview coming your way. And we're gonna preview, of course, the stakes races on the afternoon with the Uber capper, Ellis Starr. Let's take a look at the featured racing this afternoon. As far as the card goes, two graded stakes events to look forward to. The Haggard Fayette is a grade two for older horses. That goes at 4.57 p.m. And then the Queen Elizabeth II Challenge Cup. It's a grade one event, also known as the QE2. It's presented by our friends at Dixiana, and that is for fillies on the turf at 5.30 p.m. Eastern. Don't forget first post at 1.05 p.m. And as per usual, you can always download and print out that free digital program on the Keeneland website. So it's the weekend. Hopefully you have had a chance to sit back, relax, and enjoy yourself a little bit. And for some of us at home, that might involve a cocktail. So our friends at Buffalo Trace have helped us out today. Mike from Goodfellas Pizzeria here in the Lexington area is going to show you how to make the perfect Manhattan with Buffalo Trace at home. Take a look. Hello, how are we today? My name is Mike Abbott. I'm coming to you from Goodfellas Pizzeria in the Distillery District of Lexington, Kentucky. And today I wanna to make for you a traditional Manhattan using Buffalo Trace bourbon. Uh, so grab your favorite sweet vermouth. Buffalo Trace is an ideal bourbon for a Manhattan. It has a decent amount of age on it. It really took to the barrel well and with its low rye mash bill has a slight ginger spice and citrus peel note to it. So matching it up against a aperitif wine or grape based liqueur really makes that counterbalance and the shine come up out. So I just added about an ounce of Dolan sweet vermouth and then we're gonna go two full ounces of Buffalo Trace bourbon, and then three dashes of aromatic bitters. After that, we simply add some ice. And give it a good stir. Stir for about 10 to 15 seconds. This is chilling the cocktail for you to enjoy, but it is also adding just enough water to mellow out some of the uh, heat from the bourbon and blend the two flavors together. Pour this up in your favorite cocktail coupe. And in this case, I'm garnishing it with some of our house-made Brandy cherries. Cheers. Mike, thank you so much. Hopefully a few of you at home out there can enjoy a Manhattan with Buffalo Trace today as you're watching the racing from Keeneland. In this week's edition of Looking Back with Claiborne Farm, we want to tell you about the Milestone Trophy Program. Now, if you haven't heard about this, it basically awards unique trophies along with milestones for owners, our participants, and of course, winners at Keeneland. The trophies themselves are created by Tiffany's of Sterling Silver. They are hand engraved and then they are dipped in 24 karat gold. They're absolutely beautiful. I'm excited for you to learn a little bit about this program. Scott Hazelton tells us more. Winning a graded stakes race at Keeneland not only is a tremendous accomplishment, but it puts the owner of the winning horse in contention for a prestigious honor, a prize in the track's Milestone Trophy Program. Keeneland's Milestone Trophy Program features four stages of recognition for owners whose horses excel against the highest level of competition. When the program was inaugurated during the 1952 fall meet, owners whose horses won a stakes race at Keeneland were eligible. Over the years, as Keeneland's stake schedule grew, the Milestone Trophy program evolved. Since the 1994 spring meet, only graded stakes victories are eligible. Each piece in the Milestone Trophy program is handcrafted by Tiffany and Company and made of sterling silver and hand engraved before being dipped in 24 karat gold and hand polished. So how does the program work? 
when a horse wins a graded stakes, the owner receives a Keeneland Trophy Cup. When that owner wins a total of eight graded stakes races, he or she will earn a Keeneland Tray. Eight or more graded stakes wins means a Keeneland Pitcher. Another eight graded stakes victories results in a Keeneland Bowl. Eight additional graded stakes wins means the owner will receive the highest honor in the program, the Keeneland Vaz. The Keeneland Vaz was announced during the 2016 fall meet in conjunction with Keeneland's 80th anniversary. The Vaz contains elements from each of the previous milestone trophies, beating from the tray along the rims, the form and handle from the pitcher, the shape of the neck from the cup, and the base from the bowl. The same engraving detail is used on each piece and incorporates elements such as laurels, eagle, and wreath from Keeneland's signature gatepost. The cartouches are then engraved with the winning horse's name. Since Keeneland began the Milestone Trophy program 68 years ago, a total of 20 owners have earned the Keeneland tray. In the history of the Milestone Trophy program, three owners, the Hancock family's Claiborne Farm of Paris, Kentucky, William S. Farish, Master of Lanes End Farm in Versailles, Kentucky, and Bomamazan Farm of the late Millard Waldham have achieved higher levels of the Milestone Trophy program. Claiborne, the most successful owner by stakes wins in Keeneland history, became the first owner to receive a pitcher during the 1968 fall meet. Bomamazan earned a pitcher during the 1983 spring meet. Claiborne became the first owner to earn a bowl during the 2003 fall meet. Farish earned a pitcher during the 2003 spring meet and a bowl during the 2016 fall meet. During this fall meet, several owners are on the verge of winning a Keeneland tray and adding their names to a special list of recipients of a prestigious accomplishment that signifies just how special racing at Keeneland is. To date, only Claiborne and Lanes End Farm have amassed enough victories to earn a milestone bowl. And Claiborne actually has two wins towards that milestone vase. So good luck to them. And thank you to everybody who has participated in the milestone trophy program. We know that those are very cherished at home. In this week's episode of our Jockey Q&A, Gabby Gaudet has had a chance to catch up with one of the rising stars of this game. Tyler Gaffleone is just 26 years old. He's from Davie, Florida, but recently made the move to Kentucky. He is winning races in bunches, and he's quite the personality. Here is Gabby with Tyler. Tyler, thank you so much for joining me this afternoon. Um, we're going to get straight into this interview, and I'm just going to list some of these accomplishments, okay? You won leading jockey titles at the Churchill Downs Spring Meet, the Keeneland July Meet, the Churchill Downs September Meet, the Kentucky Downs Meet. That's only in 2020. And then, of course, last year, you won the Preakness. When you, when you hear these things, what goes through your mind? I feel like you're talking about someone else. Uh, you know, it's it's incredible to look back and think how blessed I've been and how fortunate I've been just to be able to live out my dream, but uh, compete in those kind of races and let alone win them. Uh, it's It's been incredible. Now, <clears throat> you've been on the big stage plenty of times, whether it be a classic race or whether it be the Breeders' Cup race. At this point in your career, do you get nervous at all? Uh, to be honest, not so much anymore. Uh, maybe last year. Uh, I think the Preakness helped a lot with that. Uh, the Derby, the Preakness, all the media that surrounded that. But, uh, you know, I just, I've just i been more comfortable riding in those type of races. Um, I've had plenty of experience. My agents made sure that uh, anytime those kind of races come up, we're trying to ride them and compete. Um, but, I mean, he's done a great job developing my career and putting me in those positions to make me uncomfortable and get familiar with those spots. What do you do though to kind of prepare yourself and mentally prepare yourself just so that you feel prepared, you feel confident, and you can get rid of those nerves for a big race? I, I do a lot of homework. Uh, as soon as the entries come out, I'm looking at the PPs. I'm studying each horse in the race. I'm trying to find one to follow. Um, just figure out the best possible um, way to get my horse to the winner's circle. 
Now you moved to Kentucky, I believe it was 2018, maybe the fall of 2018. Fall of 18. <clears throat> fall of 18. And that I felt like was a huge move for you in your career. Um, since then, how has that transition been? I mean, I know it's been a couple of years, but sometimes it takes a couple of years to make that transition and adapt. What has that transition been like for you, both professionally and personally? It's, it's been a big change, you know, for being from Florida. I uh, grew up down there. My whole life is down there, family, friends. Um, so it was difficult to change and to make the move to Kentucky. But once I got up here, you know, everyone here is so friendly. The people are great. Um, the horsemen are so kind. Uh, everybody was very welcoming. Even in the jock stream, the riders were just so great. But uh, it, it's like a family here, you know. I love Kentucky. Uh, I'm very comfortable here. Uh, we're looking to buy a house here. We're actually in the process now. But um, it's great racing, and uh, I just love it. Great stuff. Thank you again, Tyler, and good luck during the Keeneland Fall Meet. Thanks, Gabby. Appreciate you having me on. Gabby, thank you so much. And how exciting was Tyler Gaffleone on Got Stormy yesterday in the Friday feature? Boy, she was thrilling to watch. It is time to jump into our handicapping segment. And joining me once more on this Saturday is Ellis Starr, the Uber capper. Ellis, welcome back to the show. And we're looking forward to the Saturday racing. We expected some weather, but it's turned out to be a pretty nice day today. Yeah, it's going to be cloudy today. Hopefully the weather handicappers have gotten it right, maybe a tenth of an inch at the most and not enough to affect anything. We haven't had rain in Lexington for a week, so the grass will soak it up and it should be great. It was also very exciting to talk to Tyler. I really loved the race. Unfortunately, my picks ran first, third, fourth, and fifth. That's a handicapper's nightmare, isn't it? So close to that super effective, but we'll try again once more today. I do want to talk to you about the feature races, but I want to start a little bit earlier in race number five. So the fifth race on the program this afternoon is an allowance event. Six furlongs is the distance. And the one horse, Cowboy Diplomacy, is kind of a mystery to me. Ran huge a couple starts back off the layoff, but then what happened in that last race? Do we give him another chance today? I think, Christina, we do. I think that the, dif the difference was seven furlongs. Now, Cowboy Diplomacy is a full brother to Monomoy girl, champion, three-year-old filly, and 12 for 14 in her career and highly regarded. He was actually purchased uh, after she won her first race before she really got good <laughs> and would have cost a lot more than that. And he ran pretty good in his first three races, a second, third, and fourth, and then took a layoff about 13 months, 15 months actually, came back and won that race by four lengths in July at Ellis Park, which was a really big, big effort. Then last time stretched to seven furlongs, kind of pressed the pace and got tired. I think the cutback to the distance of the comeback race is the key here. And how hot is Brad Cox right now? Through yesterday, six wins and five seconds and two thirds in 17 races. Brad Cox on a tear as per usual out there. A uh, big afternoon yesterday for David Cohen as well and uh, Eminem Racing. They are running into a real star, though, this afternoon in Nashville, or at least a horse that looks like he could be a star. Ellis, this is a son of Spitestown. He was a hefty purchase at the Keeneland September 2018 sale, but he really delivered in his first career start. What are you expecting today and then just maybe in the future from Nashville? Well, certainly when a horse comes out and breaks his maiden by 11 lengths and just dominates field, um, it's big. It was only a full horse field, so it is not only a step up to allowance, but a bigger field. There are other horses in the race that need the lead, kind of like why I like Calby Diplomacy to sit off the pace, perhaps. But certainly it was big. That 106 Equipace speed figure was stakes quality and certainly uh, for Steve Asmussen, North American League Trainer in Nashville could be something special. So you have to use him. You can't toss a horse like that who's going to be the heavy favorite. But I am leaning towards Cowboy Diplomacy here with a little more experience. Looking forward to that fifth race on the program. So if you're playing any of the early multi-race exotics, be sure to include Cowboy Diplomacy. That can really change your ticket if you get a price like that. Uh, right against a heavy favorite like Nashville. Okay, let's skip ahead to the features on the program. We'll start with race number eight. This is the grade two Hagyard Fayette. A mile and an eighth is the distance on the main track. Ellis, the three horse Craft Daddy is one of those that I know you look at those Equibase speed figures and I do too. These are really pointing you in his direction with Brian Hernandez, it seems. 
Well, with these four-year-olds, and it is towards the end of their four-year-old year, but they are still have room for improvement. They're getting better, better physically and mentally. And that opening verse stakes last month was a really indicator of some quality for Crafty Dapty. Crafty Daddy and the runner-up we'll talk about in a second, in which he battled head-to-head -head the last quarter mile. It was really good. It was a career best effort. The 107 Echo Bay speed figure, you can compare to other horses. That's what it's meant to do. Every speed figure is meant to compare horses. And the win came in his second start on 11 month layoff and since changing trainers. And of course, you've got Ken McPeak behind him who posted the really nice upset last week, you know, for everybody who was rooting for Swiss Skydiver. Yeah, she was so exciting to watch, and she's back galloping in the morning. So we're looking forward to seeing what decision they make with regard to the Breeders' Cup with Swiss Skydiver. You touched on the second-place finish out of the opening verse. Uh, Captivating Moon does come back in this race just to the inside, the number two horse. Is there opportunity for Captivating Moon to turn the tables today? Possibly. You know, if you like one, you have to like the other because – he battled head and head just as nicely, just came up short. Someone had to lose, unfortunately. And he's making his second start off a layoff. So, again, you think about horses getting better physically as they race into condition. Could run very well right back. And I think these two are really good with one other shot here we're going to talk about. Yeah, one other shot for you. And it uh, looks like a horse that might be a little bit of a price. Do you like a price in this group? Yeah, number 10, Aurelius Maximus, is the most lightly raced horse in the field. Just six starts. He won in January. He had a layoff, came back and won in September. He should improve second off the layoff again. His tactical speed is very good here. If, in fact, a couple of horses get into a duel, he should be the one that may get first run on the tiring leaders. So I got to use him. And I like the three horse exacta box here. They're all good value five to one, five to one, 10 to one in the morning line, two, three, 10 exacta box for a dollar. It's only a $6 bet. And you only need two of the three to come in first and second in any order to cash a ticket. So the exact box for Ellis in the Hag Yard, Fayette. We'll move ahead to the next race on the program. Race number nine is our co-feature. This is the grade one Queen Elizabeth II Challenge Cup presented by Dick Sienna, uh, known as the QE2 here at Keeneland. And it's important to note, I think, we're going the mile and eighth on turf. These are three-year-old fillies, restricted to three-year-old fillies. As you go into the Breeders' Cup, they would have to take on older. So this ends up being kind of a Breeders' Cup in itself for some of the fillies each and every year if they decide to wait to take on the Breeders' Cup competition in the next year. Uh, there's a filly out there for my neck of the woods, Ellis, and that's Red Lark. She's the nine. Drayden Van Dyke has made the trip for Patty Gallagher. She was an upset winner of the Delmar Oaks, but can she jump up with another big race and upset them today? Well, she certainly fits and she looks to be disregarded as does the runner up California Kook. I think that's a race that could be compared, Christina, because it's a grade one race. Grade one winners win grade one races, kind of a cliche, but it's true. And Red Lark rallied from six to take the Oaks. She ran the last eighth of a mile in just under 12 seconds with a career best 117 figure. And again, these are three-year-olds, so they, they, they still have improving to do. You can expect them at the top level to plateau and stay at the same level for a while. I love the fact that Drayden Van Dyke is coming in from California to ride. Van Dyke and Patty Gallagher are a very good team, and you're going to get some value on Red Lark. Eclipse Thoroughbred Partners with the win in the Judmont Spinster last week. It would be a pretty exciting Saturday if they were able to get the victory with Red Lark today. You mentioned California Kook. Now, she was second in the Del Mar Oaks, but she would actually follow that up with an effort against the boys. Not only is she tough, but she's pretty durable. Is this too ambitious of a campaign with these last three races now pretty close in succession? I think taking a shot against the boys wasn't bad, and she wasn't disgraced when she was fourth in that race. Moving back to her own gender, I think, is a good move, and I don't know that it's too quick. I think that the, I'll trust the trainer to do it right. She was further back in the Del Mar Oaks than Red Lark, but she ran in less, actually faster, because she got the last eighth of a mile in about 11.4 seconds, and 116 figure is very, very strong, and you're going to get a high odds on her, too, because she's 12 to 1 in the morning line. So those two coming in from California, there is a New York-based filly that I'm very intrigued by. Arnold Delacour took over the training of Magic Attitude prior to the last start. Ellis, she came from France and was an impressive winner of the Belmont Oaks Invitational. How does that race sort of set the table for her in terms of what she goes on to do here in the States? Well, certainly it was an impressive win, and, and the distance is not a problem since that was longer. She was impressive. 
Uh, it was only a five horse field, but she went to last to first in the blink of an eye, which European horses had that kind of turn of foot. She was second in a group one race in France, which is as good or better as a grade one here. And she was in the French Oaks. So she has to be considered here. If she comes anywhere close to repeating that last effort, Christina, Magic Attitude should be right there at the finish with hopefully Red Lark and California Coop. It's such a good race. As you kind of look through the names there, some familiar faces, these three-year-old fillies, the QE2 today is going to be an exciting one. Ellis, as per usual, thanks for your help. Good luck on this super Saturday of racing out there at Keeneland, and I will see you back here tomorrow. Well, thanks, everybody. Have a great Saturday at Keeneland. One of the great things about this show is that we really feel like you are a part of it. So keep those comments coming. Keep the questions coming as well. And especially for our bedologist, Greg Burke is so helpful. If you have a question, he has an answer. Here he is once more with the Ask Me Anything segment. Hello, my name is Greg Burke. I'm a bedologist here at Keeneland, and I am here today to answer some of your questions from social media. A question we get on a regular basis is how do the how do the odds work? So basically in your program every morning, you see what's called the morning line odds for each horse that's set by the handicappers here at the uh, at the, the racetrack. Basically what happens in a paramutual uh, environment is that throughout the day, once the betting is opened, uh, the more money that's bet on that horse, the, the lower the odds become, it becomes more of a favorite. The fewer amount of dollars that are put on a horse, the higher the odds go, the more of a long shot it becomes. So basically what happens is, is you start the day with the morning line odds, you bet through the day, and then uh, when the, the, the horse race actually occurs and it starts, that's when the odds are locked in those are the odds that uh, all the winning bets are actually paid out at. So a really good question that we get on a regular basis is who makes the odds? How do, how do they decide what odd goes for each horse? So basically Keeneland or any racetrack has their house handicappers. Uh, they are the ones that set the morning line odds and uh, based they base those, those decisions on the past performances of the horse, uh, basically the, the pedigree of the horse. Um, they rate different uh, races and tracks differently, um, but they, they are the ones that, that, uh, that start the odds in the morning. And then as the betting public comes in, those odds move up, up and down depending on how much money is actually wagered on each one of those horses. So another good question we get on a regular basis are, what are the odds? What do they mean? So basically, the win bet is the only bet that's tied directly to the odds. Say you bet your horse $2 to win, and it goes off at five to one. That means if your horse wins, you would get back $10 on the bet plus your bet, $2. So on, on your winnings, you would be actually getting back $12. Now within the, the odds, sometimes you'll see on the board a horse that goes off at seven to two or nine to two. If you think of those just basically as fractions. So a seven to two would go, actually be going off at three and a half to one. Basically they do that just so that they can show those up on the board clearly. And it's a little bit easier than having the half mark up on the board. Heg Yard is the sponsor of today's featured Fayette Stakes. And if you aren't familiar with the Heg Yard Equine Medical Institute, you'll want to be. They are cutting edge, but also have a legacy of care, not only for the horses, but for the folks that do care for the animals themselves. Today, Scott Hazelton caught up with a very special guest, a guest that through the fifth generation of his family carries on that tradition and that legacy at Heg Yard and explains to us why this year's feature is especially significant. Today, Saturday, October 10th, marks a very special day for the Hag Yard Equine Medical Institute. And here's Dr. Luke Fallon to explain exactly why. October 10th is uh, both my father's birthday, would have been his 89th birthday, uh, Edward Fallon. And as well, it would be my parents' 62nd wedding anniversary. So it's a... Uh, it's kind of ironic that it falls on the same day as uh, the Haggard Fayette Stakes, which is very special. 
Hagyard has sponsored the $200,000 Fayette Stakes Grade 2 since 2013, enhancing a long relationship between these two iconic Lexington institutions. Uh, so Hagyard started back in 1876, and we will be celebrating our 145th anniversary next year. Started in uh, February of 1876. Uh, Keeneland and Hagyard have been community partners uh, as far as uh, philanthropy and supporting the Lexington community locally, but also the equine community internationally. Dr. Charles E. Fallon, Charlie Hagyard, served on Keeneland's first board and later became a vice president. And Harold Fallon, Dr. Ed Fallon's father, was one of six original shareholders in the company named Keeneland Racecourse, formed in 1940 to lease the Keeneland property to run two race meetings each year. Harold Fallon also participated in the new track's development and kept the books while son Ed tagged along. Dr. Luke Fallon, Dr. Ed Fallon's son, is the fifth generation of his family to practice at Hagyard Equine Medical Institute and continue his family's legacy. Uh, Dad also was very involved with uh, the Gluck Equine Research Center at the University of Kentucky. Uh, along with Jack Bryans and many other great researchers in developing new vaccines and new treatment modalities for horses that have advanced the health and well-being of, um, of not only broodmares and stallions and foals, but also racehorses around the world. In a career that spanned over a half century, Dr. Edward Haggard Fallon was a legend among equine veterinarians. Fallon both reflected and helped drive vital innovations and knowledge that Hagyard has brought to the equine world, as well as the Institute's many contributions to the equine industry and veterinary research. We're constantly trying to, as he would say, push back the frontiers and try to advance things more and more to improve, again, the health and well-being of these equine athletes. The advances that Hagyard helped veterinary science achieve the wisdom he passed along to new generations of practitioners and the practice to which he contributed so much will continue to benefit horses and people for many decades to come. The Hagyard Pharmacy is a pharmacy that we developed in the mid 90s and it was to really take care of our own internal needs. A lot of the products that we have from uh, everything from over the counter products for wound care, skin care, uh, supplements such as uh, joint supplements have been developed by our own Haggard veterinarians and they're products that we've used and tried and we believe in them and therefore we feel comfortable offering them to our uh, to our equine partners. Additionally a lot of you know the products that we need as far as prescription medications like compounds amongst others we have great confidence in the, in the quality of the products that we turn out because we use them ourselves. Keeneland and Hagyard have stayed true to their mission to help the equine athletes and those that take care of them. That's going to wrap things up for us today on Keeneland at Home. And as usual, a special thanks to our sponsors. A special thanks to Hagyard, who you just had a chance to learn a little bit more about, to Dixiana, and also to UK Healthcare, ranked Kentucky's number one hospital for five years in a row. Be sure to tune in for the racing this afternoon. And don't forget, you can watch the full card from home on your TV, phone, or computer. On television, you can head over to TVG with my colleagues, also available on YouTube. If you have your phone fired up, if you're out and about, don't forget about that Keeneland Race Day app. We hope you already have it downloaded, but if not, be sure to do so. And then on the computer, keeneland.com, Keeneland Select, and on YouTube as well. As usual, we will send you out with a real bird set at the burl. And today, Wayne Graham plays us out. We'll see you tomorrow. Cock-a-doodle-doo